my name is Tony. British director Peter Yates made the landmark 60s US police thriller Bullet with Steve McQueen. If that had been the only thing he'd ever done, his place in movie history would still have been guaranteed. Any future commercial success never matched it, and nothing he made after had quite the same sell your grandmother and her dog if you have to but see this film impact on the movie going public. The friends of Eddie Coyle in an ideal world would have, but wouldn't you know, it just didn't. It was the first mainstream movie, so far as I can recall, to set itself in the world of the Boston mob, sometimes referred to as the Irish Mafia. Based on the superb hard-boiled novel of the same name by George V. Higgins, the characters are framed as everyday working-class stiffs and lowlifes. Some of them have regular jobs, but their main source of income results from criminal activities. Eddie Coyle, or Eddie Fingers to cite his nickname, played by Robert Mitchum, is a low-level gun runner, sourcing untraceable firearms from his contacts and selling them on to heisters and hit men with mafia connections. Eddie is aging, burnt out, and looking at a prison stretch for getting caught driving a lorry load of stolen liquor in New Hampshire. He did the job as a favour to Dylan, Peter Boyle, who runs a mob-owned bar diner and is himself a criminal type. Looking down the barrel of a five-year sentence, Eddie figures his wife will end up on welfare and frets over the impact on his three young kids. His lot in life is not a happy one. His aim is to stay out of jail. Coyle supplies guns to a bank heist team led by Jimmy Scalise, Alex Rocco and Artie Van Joe Santos. These boys have a format for robbery. They hold the families of the bank managers hostage whilst the bank manager accompanies them to the bank and allows them to clear out the vault. Then they let the manager and their family go. They leave little to chance so every time they hit a bank they purchase clean shooters. Coyle's supplier, played by Stephen Keats, is Jackie Brown. Familiar name that? Brown lets it be known to Coyle that he's going to be supplying some customers with M16 automatic rifles. The customers in question are a young hippie couple who reckon they need machine guns to knock over some banks of their own. I guess peace and love and down with capitalism was something of a bygone by 74 then. Coyle comes up with a plan to stay out of the chokey. He approaches glib federal agent Dave Foley, Richard Jordan, and offers to provide information on the sale of some machine guns in return for getting the case against him dropped. What Eddie doesn't know is that Dylan is Foley's longtime snitch and has been feeding him in tell for years. Eddie sells Jackie out, and he is arrested by Foley and his team. Foley then thanks Eddie for his information, but informs that the New Hampshire DA didn't feel it was enough to get his case kicked out. He must come up with something else of significant value. During one of the bank heists, an astoundingly dumb employee sets off a silent alarm and is shot dead. The gang are now wanted on a murder charge. This doesn't stop Eddie providing them with more guns, or them going for another round, which proves to be their downfall when they invade the home of their next bank manager victim, Foley and his crew were waiting to apprehend them and take them into custody. Someone has talked. Who could it be? Next day, Coyle meets with Foley and offers to provide information that will lead to the arrest of the heist team in return for his conviction being dropped. Foley tells him he's too late, shows him a newspaper, the front page headline, proclaiming the arrest of the robbers. Coyle is going down. But it's worse than that, folks. Dylan, the actual informant, is approached by a mob representative. The head honcho, the man referentially, wants Coyle hit immediately, and Dylan, who has form as a capable hitman, has got the job whether he wants it or not. Coyle visits Dylan's bar, depressed and drinking heavily. Dylan invites him out to an ice hockey match, where he and a young mob associate, introduced as his nephew, ply him with more drink. When Coyle falls asleep on the car journey home, Dylan has his nephew drive them to a quiet stretch of road and shoots the sleeping Coyle in the head. Drive into a deserted mall, they park up, swap cars and head off. The film ends on Dylan meeting with Foley. Foley thanks him for his information leading to the arrest of the bank robbers. Dylan apologises that he can provide no assistance regarding the recent murder of Eddie Coyle. Foley infers he has an inkling that Dylan may have been involved in it, but isn't all that interested, to be honest. They walk off in different directions. It's a moody, grimy, grungy little opus that clinically takes pains to deglamorize the criminal fraternity and their lives. These people aren't living the high life. They populate a dangerous dog-eat-dog bear pit with a moral compass so skewed and bent out of shape there's no telling who's doing what to who or why. If there's a key villain, it rhymes with Dylan. Effectively, he's not much worse than anyone else on show. Foley has him on a $20 a week retainer, and for that paltry sum, he'd sell out Jesus, the Twelve Disciples, and 
and the Virgin Mary. Coyle got pinch working for him. Coyle is a fall guy because of him. Coyle gets whacked because of him. And it's him that does the whacking. The Friends of Eddie Coyle is therefore big on irony. Even the title is an ironic harbinger. Eddie doesn't have any friends. Is he a better man than Dylan? Superficially. His only payoff is to stay out of the pen. But to do so, he sells out Jackie Brown and would have handed over Scalise and his gang if only Dylan hadn't got there first. When he quietly rages and broods over who could have informed, he does so whilst drinking in Dylan's bar and directly to the man who was the actual grass. His anguish isn't because he cares about the fate of the heist team, he's pissed because he was beaten to the punch and must now take his medicine. Oh yeah, the irony. In his thrillers, Yates seemed to have a thing for characters in various stages of alienation who find themselves facing adverse circumstances they must endeavour to navigate. On the other hand, his more dramatised or romantic outings, The Dresser, Breaking Away, indulged a more sentimental approach. Sentiment plays little part in the world of Eddie Coyle. You most likely won't sympathise with anyone because they don't do much to earn themselves any sympathy. Jackie will sell guns to whoever pays up, with next to no thought as to what uses they might be put to. Dylan is a dirty rat, to coin a phrase, and killer. And Eddie, even though we are privy to brief glimpses of his domestic setup, three school-age kids understanding and good-natured Irish wife of long-suffering remains self-pitying and self-absorbed and ultimately selfish. Yates directs with a meticulous eye for CD detail and nuance. The script by Paul Monash predates the Tarantino hook of having characters relate an anecdotal story. Early on, Eddie explains to Jackie how he got the nickname Eddie Fingers. He fucked up on a deal someone got sent down and that someone's friends paid Eddie a visit. They had him put his hand in a desk drawer and kicked it shut. Nothing personal, you understand, just had to be done, so he has an extra set of knuckles on his hand. Hence, Eddie Fingers. Why not Eddie Knuckles? Who knows? Mitchum is as magnificent as ever. His crumpled, lived-in face and hound dog eyes effortlessly convey a life of bad choices, with no meaningful return for the input. He's done for, which, if it's something he doesn't know already, he must certainly suspect. It was in his later films, like Eddie Coyle and the Yakuza, that it became increasingly obvious just how good a screen actor Robert Mitchum was. He gets sterling support from Peter Boyle. His Dylan is a pasty-faced, dead-eyed psychopath who does bad things because it's almost second nature. He doesn't see consequences for himself, only for others, and has made an art form of looking out for number one. A sort of spiritual cannibal, only concerned with where his next meal is coming from. Richard Jordan, who usually played smart or alternatively dumb, heavies and underlings gets a chance to shine as the slippery but ruthless investigator focused only on taking down criminals prepared to use any one any manipulative strategy to this end then stephen keats as the youthful but switched on gun merchant jackie brown is equally impressive he's foley's flip side if you like both are tuned in early 70s dudes with confident game faces and steely resolve only on opposite sides of the law it's a slow-burning tale, unwinding at a leisurely pace, but it scores major points for intense atmosphere and carefully curated craftwork. It's helped along by Dave Grusin's twangy and funky score and Victor J. Kemper's cinematography, which captures the grit, grain, and downcast moodiness with bruised, shadowy elegance. It's a film with only short bursts of action, not comparable with something like Bullet by a long shot. There is little explicit violence or bloodshed, and no sex or nudity. What fights its corner is the the intricate drama, the simmering sense of impending doom, and the impeccably drawn character studies. In one respect, it's almost like a documentary about ordinary low-hanging plebs who just so happen to be criminals, and it reinforces the off-sighted belief that most criminals are not very bright people. They persevere at doing the same things in the same way, trusting in people who are just as untrustworthy as they are, the fucking criminals, see, then wonder how it all goes wrong, and they get caught bang to rights with their pants down and their dicks out. I can quite easily easily see why it flatlined at the box office, why it didn't captivate the attention of the public. It's not exactly a ray of sunshine. It's raw, hard-boiled, and as unsentimental as a retaining wall with concrete cancer. I can also understand why it is regarded today as a key early 70s crime movie of crucial import and influence, because I personally think it's one of the very best. So shoot me. Thank you for your time and attention. Do whatever you want to do. Hit like, don't like, comment, subscribe, be a patron of my Patreon thing, make a financial contribution to keep the wheels turning via the thanks button, or just go straight to jail and do not pass go. See you on the inside, pilgrims.